Okay, friends, let me begin with a bit of a joke, a lighthearted story. A man was sick and tired of going to work every day while his wife stayed home. So he prayed to God, dear Lord, I go to work every day and put in eight hours while my wife merely stays at home. I want her to know what I go through. So please allow her body to switch with mine for a day. God in his infinite wisdom granted the man's wish. The next morning, sure enough, he awakes as his wife and she as him. He arose, cooked breakfast for his mate, awakened the kids, fed them breakfast, taught them English and math, put them all in the car, picked up the dry cleaning, took it to the cleaner, stopped at the bank to make a deposit, went grocery shopping, then drove home to put away the groceries, paid the bills and balanced the checkbook, cleaned the cat's litter box, bathed the dog, then it was already 1 p.m. and he hurried to make the beds, do the laundry, vacuum, dust, and sweep and mop the kitchen floor. At 3.30 p.m., he dropped one child off at a scout meeting, another at soccer, third at piano lessons, then went home to do the laundry. At 6.30 p.m., he began peeling potatoes, washing vegetables for salad, breaded the schnitzel for supper. After supper, he cleaned up the kitchen, ran the dishwasher, folded laundry, bathed the kids, put them to bed. At 9 p.m., he was utterly exhausted. And though his daily chores weren't finished, he went to bed where he was expected to be intimate with his wife, which he managed to do without complaint. The next morning he awakes and immediately kneels by the bed and turns his eyes heavenward. Lord, he says, I don't know what I was thinking. I was so wrong to envy my wife for being able to stay at home all day. Please, oh, please let us trade back. The Lord in his infinite wisdom replied, my son, I feel you have learned your lesson and I will be happy to change things back to the way they were. You'll just have to wait nine months though because last night you became pregnant. Friends, a few years ago, just after we started our Hebrew school, I learned an important lesson from our head teacher about the ideal method of teaching. She introduced me to something called experiential learning and teaching. So for example, in a Hebrew school classroom, one teaches about the seven days of creation. And uh, typically what happens is, you know, the teacher will come in and take the blackboard and scribble across it diagonally with a piece of white chalk. And with the rest of the chalk, she will scribble in one of the corners in white, the other corner black. And this will somehow depict the image or it will somehow convey the contribution of the creation of light before which there was no distinction between the two. And she said, we will do something different. We're going to get the kids in and we're going to turn all the lights off and ensure that the room is pitch black and then give out flashlights. And then at the count of three, we'll tell them to turn on the light. They will. And suddenly they will know experientially the difference between darkness and light. They will have experienced and in that way deeply and profoundly internalized what it is that took place, as it were, on the first day of creation. And so today I'd like to share an example of how experiential education is actually rooted in the Torah and is, in fact, the preferred method of teaching. But first, let me share with you a watershed moment in biblical narrative. Let me set the scene for you. We are about to encounter a very tender moment in the relationship between God and Abraham, recounted in the beginning of the book of Genesis. And I quote, after these incidents, the word of Hashem came to Abraham in a vision saying, fear not, Avram, I am your shield. Your reward is exceedingly great. Abraham seizes the moment and asks God to bless him with a child. God promises him a child. And he took him outside and God said to Abraham, please look heavenward and count the stars if you are able to count them. And he said to Avram, so will be your seed. Now the sun is ready to set and a deep sleep falls upon Avram. And behold, a great darkness was falling upon him. And here the story takes a very unexpected turn. And I quote, And God says to Abraham, you shall surely know that your seed will be strangers in a land that is not their own. And they will enslave them and oppress them. That is to say, the Jewish people will be oppressed and enslaved there for 400 years. And here's the obvious question. Is this the best way to consummate a loving relationship? Besides, this period of terrible persecution and oppression in Egypt takes place before the Jewish people ever had a chance to violate the covenant, to veer from the path of holiness and sin. And therefore, their enslavement in Egypt cannot be explained as a means of affecting spiritual healing and cleansing in the way that some of our other national calamities and exiles are explained by our sages. So what could possibly have been the reason 
and the objective of this devastating period of enslavement and degradation. The question is especially disturbing if we take into account the timing of this harrowing decree. Just as we, the Jewish people, were experiencing our national birth and infancy, when we were most vulnerable and susceptible to trauma. You know, the verse in Ezekiel, the prophet Yechezkel teaches, and as for your birth on the day you were born, your navel was not yet cut, neither were you washed with water for cleansing, nor were you salted, nor swaddled at all. As Rashi says, this refers to the period when we were in Egypt, which is compared to our national birth. And so once again, what is the logic in linking this very formative period of our national evolution and genesis with potentially our most profound suffering and persecution, that period of collective enslavement over hundreds of years, over hundreds of years. So I'd like to suggest that the timing of our enslavement was calculated and precise and was chosen because of, not despite our impressionability. In order to explain this and unpack this idea, let me share with you an excerpt of a groundbreaking book written in the 60s by a school teacher named Jane Elliott, which continues to have social reverberations until today. As it happens, a few weeks ago, I had the uh, privilege of interviewing Jane Elliott 52 or 53 years after she first began this work. And it was a fascinating conversation uh, and a window into that particular exercise I'm about to share with you and its effects across the country and across time. And I quote, that Friday morning in April 1968 was not a normal morning. The day before Martin Luther King had been murdered in Memphis. For Jane, that had suddenly made a lot of things different. She had made a decision about what she would do in her class, a decision that now made her reluctant to leave her house for school. Setting aside her doubts, she opens the door to room 10, turns on the lights and went to her desk. As she sat down, she saw before her the Sioux prayer she had planned to teach her children. Keep me from ever judging a man until I have walked a mile in their moccasins. This is, of course, a, uh, if you will, a, um, a variation of a quote that surfaces first in our teachings, the Havdil, uh, the teachings of Pirkei Avot, we find it. Do not judge a man until you are, have reached his place. al tadinus haver chachetagilim komo vayhilo. And it was precisely the lesson she hoped to teach today, though not at all as she had contemplated. First, she thought unhappily her students were going to have to walk that mile. And what happened next in Jane Elliott's classroom was, as far as she knew, a product of her own mind. She had never heard of anyone else who had done it. She was not even sure it was a good idea. She knew only that she had to do something, and this was all she had thought of to try. The idea went back to a half-angry, half-humorous remark she had made to a college roommate years before. Returning to school from a weekend in Riceville, where she grew up, she had told her roommate about an argument she had had with her father on the subject of race. Remembering as she talked about it, how her father's hazel eyes had blazed at her accusations of prejudice, she told her roommate, if hazel eyes ever go out of style, my father is going to be in trouble. She had no sooner said it than it struck both girls as an interesting observation. Skin color, eye color, hair color, or texture, it made as much sense, they decided, to discriminate on the basis of one as another. The two of them talked far into the night about how it must feel to grow up as a person of color in America. Jane took a deep breath and plunged right in. She's speaking to her class and she says, I don't think we really know what it would be like to grow up as a black child, do you? I mean, it would be hard to know really unless we actually experienced discrimination ourselves, wouldn't it? Without real interest, the class agreed. Well, would you like to find out? The children's puzzlement was plain on their faces until she spelled out what she meant. Suppose we divided the class into blue-eyed and brown-eyed children. And suppose that for the rest of today, the blue-eyed children became the inferior group. And then on Monday, we could reverse it so that the brown-eyed children will be inferior. Wouldn't that give us a better understanding of what discrimination means? Now there was enthusiasm in their response. Would you like to try it, Jane asked. There was an immediate chorus of assent. Divided by eye color, Jane's class was made up of 17 children with blue eyes, three with green eyes, and eight with brown eyes. To make things more even, the green-eyed children were lumped with the brown-eyed children. 
Today, she tells her class, the blue-eyed people will be on the bottom and the brown-eyed people on the top. At their puzzled looks, she went on. What I mean is that brown-eyed people are better than blue-eyed people. They are cleaner than blue-eyed people. They are more civilized than blue-eyed people. They are smarter than blue-eyed people. When they still look puzzled, Jane nodded her head and said, it's true, it really is. Now the brown-eyed children began to look at each other in wonder. They sat up straighter in their chairs, waiting to hear more. The blue-eyed children frowned. They stirred uneasily, not understanding. One blue-eyed boy slumped way down in his chair. What color are your eyes? Jane asked him. Blue, said the boy, straightening up. Is that the way we've been taught to sit in class? No, the boy said. Do blue-eyed people remember what they've been taught? Jane asked the class. There was a chorus of no's from the brown-eyed children as they began to see how it would work. The blue-eyed boy now sat bolt upright, his hands folded neatly in the center of his desk. A brown-eyed boy near him, one of his closest friends, gave him a withering, disdainful look. It began that quickly. Long before noon, Jane says, I was sick. I wished I'd never started this. During the morning recess, I went to the teacher's lounge and told three other teachers what I was doing. They laughed. I went back to my empty room and cried. By lunch hour, there was no need to think before identifying a child as blue or brown-eyed. I could tell simply by looking at them. The brown-eyed children were happy, alert, having the time of their lives. The blue-eyed children were miserable. Their posture, their expressions, their entire attitudes were those of defeat. Inside an hour or so, they looked and behaved as though they were in fact inferior. It was shocking. But even more frightening was the way the brown-eyed children turned on their friends of the day before, the way they accepted almost immediately as true what had originally been described merely as an exercise. For there was no question after an hour or so that they actually believed that they were superior. It was as though someone had pointed out to them something they simply hadn't noticed before. On Monday, all of the children in Jane's class came to school. Briefly, she recalled to them all that they had done on Friday and how it had begun. Then, as the blue-eyed children became restless and fidgety, she said, I lied to you on Friday. I told you brown-eyed people are better than blue-eyed people. That's not true. There was an expectant hush. The truth is that blue-eyed people are better than brown-eyed people. They are smarter than brown-eyed people. She guessed as she went through the entire list for the second time that there might now be greater resistance to what she was saying. Perhaps having been fooled once, they would have no more of this nonsense. Yet watching their faces carefully, she saw that it was having an effect. The faces that had been so cheerful on Friday were rapidly falling into depressed scowls. Those that had been glum on Friday brightened with pleasure. Jane continued to reverse Friday's procedure, reviewing the restrictions that today would apply to the brown-eyed children. And she said, and I quote, I had not expected that the brown-eyed children, knowing full well after their experience on Friday that it was all an exercise and that it would last only a day, would react as intensely as the others had to the experience of discrimination. But they did. Within minutes, they'd become nervous, depressed, and resentful. The only real difference that day was that the blue-eyed children, now on top, were noticeably less vicious in their treatment of the underlings than the latter had been to them. Friends, that to me is the key phrase. The only real difference was that those who had been discriminated against on an earlier day were today more compassionate, more empathetic, and less vicious in the treatment of those who are being discriminated against today. In the book of Shemot, we read, and I quote, and you shall not oppress a stranger, for you know the feelings of the stranger since you were strangers in the land of Egypt. There you have it spelled out in all of its breathtaking moral beauty. Egypt was the classroom, God the teacher, the Jewish people his students, and the experiential lesson was empathy. And there was no better time to teach us this lesson than that, that would come to define our national instinct and DNA then in our most formative years, precisely because that was when we were most receptive and most moldable. And here we come to something that is absolutely astounding. The Jerusalem Talmud teaches that while still in Egypt, while still themselves slaves, God instructed Moshe to command the Jewish people regarding the laws of freeing slaves. Imagine that. 
Verses earlier, God says, I heard the moans of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians are persecuting, holding in bondage. We read further that the Jewish people did not hearken to Moshe because of their shortness of breath and because of their hard labor. In other words, the Jewish people could barely stand up straight and catch their breath when Moshe gathers them around for his State of the Union address. And what is his message to this battered and broken group of slaves? He might have talked about liberty, the breaking of their chains, and the end of slavery. He might have talked about the destination to which they were about to travel, the land flowing with milk and honey. Or he might have chosen a more somber theme, the journey that lay ahead, the dangers they would face. What Nelson Mandela called the long walk to freedom. Any of these would have been the speech of a great leader, sensing a historic moment in the destiny of the Jewish people. Instead, Moshe, forever lovingly referred to as Rabbeinu, our teacher, says the following. Take your pain and your humiliation and channel it into an unshakable resolution never to perpetrate what was done unto you. And instead, to constantly represent and give voice and defend those who are defenseless, voiceless, and discriminated against. Amazingly, Moshe himself embodies this powerful lesson while in Midian. The Torah tells us that he names his son Gershom. And why? What is the etymology of Gershom? What is its meaning? What was he trying to remember, to embody? The Torah says, he called him Gershom, for he said, Gersham, I was a stranger, Ger, Sham, Vir, that is to say, in a foreign land. Okay, Moshe is trying to recall the fact that he understands deeply what it is like to be the other, what it is like to be that stranger, to feel uncomfortable, an outsider, not included, not one of, the them rather than the us. Now, let me ask you a simple question. When you have a child and you name them something, essentially what you're doing is you're trying to recall, you're trying to eternalize, immortalize a particular experience or sentiment, a feeling, an idea. After all, you're going to be interacting with your child throughout their life. And so every time you call their name, that will be a reminder, as it were, of something deeply important to you. Why would Moshe choose to name his son after a deeply distressing and traumatizing experience when he was othered, as it were, by the host society and culture? Why create a constant reminder of a most traumatic event? But you see, here's the powerful point. Moshe was practicing what he would later teach the Jewish people. He never wanted to forget that pain. He never wanted to forget and delete that sentiment. He wanted it to be a guiding light and a guiding force in his own sensitivities, sensibilities. He wanted it to shape his values, the value of compassion, of inclusivity, of empathy. He never wanted to forget what it was like to be a stranger. And here we come to a very important teaching. Moshe doesn't just call on the Jewish people to channel their emotion into empathy in the abstract. He immediately insists on translating that passion, translating that experience into practical action. You know, there is a saying that the devil is in the details. It's not true. The devil is actually in the abstract, in the generalizations. It is God who is in the details. And you know, it's incredible to note that the Torah spells this out on so many occasions. And uh, we'll just share a few examples of this. For example, in the book of Deuteronomy, we learn as the basis for the following laws. Again, these are just a sampling of so many laws that form the bedrock of Jewish inclusivity and empathy. The Torah says, when you lend your fellow any item, you shall not enter his home to take his security, his collateral. Instead, stand outside, and the man to whom you're extending the loan shall bring the security to you outside. In other words, do not violate his personal space. His, do not diminish his dignity. You do not own him. Yes, you have lent him something. And yes, he owes you something, but that's a transaction. There is no ownership. Do not invade his sanctuary, his comfort zone. Do not diminish his, the divine image in which he was created. And if he is a poor man, you shall not lie down to sleep with his security. That is to say, if, for example, he gave in lieu of the loan, a pillow or a blanket, do not keep it with you overnight. You shall return the security to him by sunset. 
so that he may lie down to sleep in his garment. Another law, you shall not pervert the judgment of a stranger or an orphan, and you shall not take a widow's garment as a security for a loan. Another law, when you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to it. It shall be left for the stranger, the orphan, the widow, so that the Lord your God will bless you in all that you do. Interesting, this is the only mitzvah that can only be performed through forgetfulness, through forgetting a particular sheaf in the field. Furthermore, when you pick the grapes of your vineyard, you shall not glean after you. It shall be left for the stranger, the orphan, and the widow. Okay, so these are, again, just a few samples of certain mitzvot relating to those who are marginalized, to those to whom life was not kind to, as it were, to those who are left on the side to the others. And how does the Torah frame all of these groundbreaking laws of compassion that today we might refer to as social justice, as human rights? The Torah says, you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I command you to do this thing. Incredible. Indeed, it's been pointed out that while the Torah teaches us only once to love your fellow Jew like yourself, it teaches us on no less than 36 occasions to love the stranger, to love the convert, to love the outsider, to love the superficially imposed and defined other. I want to conclude with a final thought, some reflections on how has that experiment described previously feared? Has it been successful or not? So I want to share with you a number of quotes that come from non-Jewish people and philosophers, historians throughout history. And I believe that it's through their words, rather than, you know, Jewish sentiments of patting ourselves on the back, that we come to a particular historical um, insight. Here's a quote from the second president of the United States, John Adams, who said, I will insist that the Hebrews have contributed more to civilized men than any other nation. If I was an atheist and believed in blind eternal fate, I should still believe that fate had ordained the Jews to be the most essential instrument for civilizing the nations. Here we have a quote from Paul Johnson, a Christian historian. He says, certainly the world without the Jews would have been a radically different place. Humanity might have eventually stumbled upon all the Jewish insights, but we cannot be sure. To them, we owe the idea of equality before the law, both divine and human, of the sanctity of life and the dignity of human person, of social responsibility, and many other items which constitute the basic moral furniture of the human mind. Without them, a much, it may have been a much emptier place. In an address, I find this fascinating. On October 19, 2002, Mr. Matlan, who was the Secretary General of the African National Congress, the ANC, said the following, and I quote, that people of Jewish descent should be so prominent in the liberation movement says something fundamental about the compassion of Judaism. Many Jewish immigrants arrived on our shores in abject poverty, laying claim to little but their rich commitment to humanitarian and egalitarian ideals. These commitments were rooted in traditional Jewish teaching. Jewish compassion is the fruit of empathy rather than sympathy. Sympathy, of course, is feeling bad for someone else, empathy with someone else. And when do we develop that particular sensibility and sensitivity, as mentioned, in our infancy, as we were being molded, as we were being shaped, as we were being incubated and marinated, as it were, in that sauce, as it's supposed to speak, of compassion, of empathy, of experiential learning. Edmund Wilson, a U.S. literary critic, said the Jew lends himself easily to communism because it enables him to devote himself to a high cause involving all of humanity, characteristics which are natural to him as a Jew. And I could go on. And the point here is, of course, not to, again, single out a particular group as being more empathetic necessarily. It is to say that here we find, I believe, an articulation of the success of that particular experiment outlined above that experiential lesson about what it means and what it feels like to be that outsider so that we channel that pain and that trauma and that sentiment into concrete effort time and again in every generation across place, space, and time to uplift, to illuminate, to facilitate those who are relegated to the sidelines. Friends, our world is suffering from what I would call an empathy deficit. 
We live in a world that is unfortunately very divided, very polarized politically, socioeconomically, ideologically, religiously, and very tragically racially. And so the takeaway message for today is let us dedicate ourselves to a fundamental aspect of our national identity. Let us teach the world by our example, the lessons we learned in Egypt. Let us create an empathy revolution that will result in the ultimate revelation and revolution of the messianic era, when our sages and prophets teach that there would be neither famine, nor war, nor conflict, hostility, anger, envy, or strife. And he bless us all that that day comes speedily in our day. Amen. Thank you for listening. All the very best.